I think we'll go ahead and get started. I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, this month's webinar, uh, Agricultural Situation, uh, Agricultural Market Situation Outlook webinar series we've been holding since the start of COVID. Uh, now, almost four years ago, we're getting close to the anniversary. Uh, but today we have uh, a few folks on the docket. Uh, Brian, Tim, and I will be speaking virtually, but in real time, and we have a recorded uh, talk from Frayne as well. Uh, same standard, uh, same policy as us usual. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask them during the talk, but we'll save those towards the end. And obviously, with Frayne not here in real time, we can we can communicate uh, those to him, or you can even contact him directly if you'd like. Uh, but with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to to Brian. Uh, I've I've given a couple of talks the last uh, few days um, across North Dakota, talking about production costs for the year, um, everything from fertilizer, land prices, and equipment. Uh, and I'm going to go through some of those in in uh, upcoming uh, our upcoming talks, our upcoming webinar series as we get closer and closer to spring planning. But what I wanted to do today mainly was just a macro outlook for um, just real quick for the U.S. and for interest rates and inflation and kind of what we're expecting for, for 2024. All right. So this is where we're, we're, where we're at right now. Um, if you look at this, I, I put when, when I put this uh, built this chart with the Fed uh, Federal Reserve tool, I included a uh, headline inflation, which is often reported and then core inflation, which is all also uh, reported quite often as well. And all the only, the difference between the two, as, as I've stated before, is core inflation uh, removes food and energy costs from the from that number. And uh, we've seen, you know, we we peaked out, of course, as you'll recall, uh, around the summer, June or so of uh, 2022. And since then, inflation, uh, especially headline, has has come down. Um, remarkably and and as has core but you can see here if you look uh core inflation has been for the last three months or so kind of been staying steady around four percent uh and uh headline inflation uh bouncing between three and three and a half percent or so the last report that just came out it was actually higher than expectations uh it, economists had projected it to be flat or maybe maybe even possibly down a little bit and and uh, headline inflation actually ticked up. So what you're seeing is the Fed's taken uh, a bunch of actions to uh, account for for inflation inflationary pressure. but overall uh, things have kind of leveled off and and it and this, these inflation numbers have been kind of stubborn to come down further and keeping in mind that the the Federal Reserve's target for inflation is around two percent. and if you look back at January of 19, through January of, of 2020, so that year, that's that's right around where it was, and that's kind of the target that the Federal Reserve is shooting for. And so, I just wanted to uh, put this up there to remind everyone: this is the Federal Reserve rate hikes that have happened since March of uh, March 17 of 2022, and it went from about a quarter uh, of a percentage point to where we are uh, with the last rate hike occurring um, July of 2026 going up to almost five and a half percent as far as the federal funds rate. And as we know, that's not the that's not the consumer rate, but it it does influence it significantly. And it pushed our our mortgage rates and uh, up around seven and a half, eight percent and loans on operating notes had gone up to eight, eight, eight and a half percent or so equipment loans around eight percent and real estate loans and agriculture are around 7.9 percent. That's where they peaked. Now, they've come off a little bit in the last uh, few months, mainly because of optimism about the Federal Reserve possibly cutting rates in this year, 2024. But here's a I wanted to put these quotes out there directly. Because a lot of times what, what folks see in the news, you know, what talking heads on TV or reporters, um, analysts, so to speak, uh, putting together what they think is going to happen. Um, they, they take a lot of the statements that come from the federal federal board of governors or the Fed chairman and then kind of pick out certain phrases. And what I want to show here is this this came directly from one of the board of governors, Governor Waller. And he said, 
and this is a direct quote, as long as inflation doesn't rebound and stay elevated, he believes the, the FOMC will be able to lower the target uh, target range for the federal funds rate this year. But I, I put this in bold, as long as inflation doesn't rebound and stay elevated. Okay, so what does stay elevated mean? Well, if I go back here, it's just been, if he's saying stay and elevated, well, the last three months, it's been kind of hanging around this number here and it has come down off those. So you might take that to mean, well, it's kind of been staying elevated. And so even if it doesn't uh, go back up higher, if it just keeps staying around that 4% core rate above three, three and a half on the headline uh, to them, that's probably staying elevated. And that's, that's what's happened the last, uh, last three months or so. And then the second part, direct quote, uh, when the time is right to begin lowering, lowering rates, he says, I believe it can and should be lowered methodically and carefully. Hmm. Okay. So I've seen reports in the news that are saying six or seven rate cuts in 2024. To me, that doesn't sound very uh, uh, lowered methodically or carefully. That's That sounds pretty aggressive as far as some rate cutting goes. And then he goes on to say, in many previous cycles, the FOMC cut rates reactively and did so quickly and often by large amounts. This cycle, however, I see no reason to move as quickly or cut as rapidly as in the past. And that's a direct quote from the Federal Reserve Board of Governors. Okay. Not synthesized from an analyst, not me speaking. That's that's directly uh, what they said. And so as you read that, you say, well, hmm, how, I've been hearing expectations for rate cuts coming soon, you know, six, maybe seven rate cuts in 2024. Well, if you take them at their word, that that that's not what I take out of this. This sounds a lot more like, well, we're going to look at the data and we're going to wait and see what happens. And if and when we it is appropriate to cut rates, it's going to be a very slow, methodical process, probably as slow and methodical as the rate hikes turned out to be. So then I also want to turn to this because this is often um, something that isn't talked about as much, but it does affect uh, inflation and monetary policy. And that is what the Federal Reserve has done with its total assets. Now, what they do is the Federal Reserve will own uh, many different uh, investment tools or bonds or treasuries or whatever the case may be. And if the Federal Reserve buys them, Essentially, what happens is then the investment community in the United States, private investment, does not buy them, leaving funds available for them to invest in other things, which is a quantitative easing uh, situation. In this case here, if they allow these bonds to just, they don't roll them and they expire, then those like treasuries, for instance, are then, uh, in order to get them sold, uh, private investment has to buy them up. And then that takes money out of the economy for investment and other things. Because if you're buying treasuries, you're not buying, you're not investing in Microsoft or Apple or or anything or something else like that. So then that takes money out of the uh, uh, out of the economy, so to speak, because the Fed is not pumping it in by buying these bonds. And you can see, or since 2022, they've been rolling off, you know, uh, fairly quickly. Uh, but we're still not even to where, I mean, this Fed's balance sheet is still much larger than it was even in uh, prior to the pandemic or just after the pandemic even occurred. Uh, it's going to take several more months probably of this allowing these these bonds to expire without rolling them to be able to get down to even where that was. So in other words, there's still a lot of cash in the economy uh, right now, uh, courtesy of the some of the Fed's actions. And then the other thing I want to mention here is then on the um, unemployment side, because one of the th things that the Fed focuses on very carefully is the unemployment statistics. And this is uh, from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. See right there in the lower left corner, direct graph from them. And unemployment's been hanging out below 4% now since December, actually October, November of 21, uh, just kind of staying there. Uh, well below 4%. In fact, it's as low as it was prior to the pandemic, December of 19, you know, right around that same range. And this graph only goes back to 2003. But if you go back even further, 3.7% is really low. I mean, getting historically low. And a big reason for that is the fact that the number of unemployed people divided by the number of job openings um, is 0.7. So in other words, there are... Uh, Fewer unemployed people than job openings. 
And I put this graph in there uh, to show if you look at the red line, if the if this blue line touches the red line, then that means there's the same number of unemployed people as there are job openings. OK, if it's above it, there's more unemployed people than job openings. And if there's if it's below it like it is now, then there are more job openings than unemployed people. And you kind of go back to the Great Recession, for instance, there were six times over six times as many unemployed people as job openings. The pandemic, of course, occurs. You have a big layoffs, you know, the especially the hospitality sector suffers a lot of job opening or a lot of unemployed people, not very many job openings. But then that's kind of corrected. And since well, um, mid 21, uh, we've you know, it's been hard to fill a lot of the positions uh, that, have, that have been out there uh, and available. Uh, there just aren't enough workers to fill them. And the reason I bring that up is unemployment is one of the dry, one of the factors that contribute to inflation or the reduction in inflation. Unemployed people do, or people concerned about becoming unemployed, maybe because they see their friend or their neighbor get laid off or whatever, when they're worried about themselves, they don't spend a lot of money. They they tend to save, which can, which keeps prices lower. Because if we're all not out there buying, then prices have to have to stay lower. My point to that is that's something that. As as we go back to the Federal Reserve uh, uh, Gov Board of Governor comments, um, they're going to be sitting there watching the data and the data for unemployment says we're not going to be seeing a big increase in unemployment anytime soon. Even if it went up uh, a percentage point from 3.7 to 4.7, that's still, if we go back on this time horizon, not that high. I mean, it would it would be higher than it's been lately, but that's not exactly a high unemployment rate. Right. And it would take a lot to get to there, considering there's more job openings than than job seekers. And then the one of the uh, then finally, I want to talk real quick about the because um, inflation. Is also dependent upon the expectation of the consumer, if people think that prices are going to go up in the future, then they hurry up and buy things today so that they don't have to pay higher prices in the future, which drives up the prices today which increases inflation. The other thing that can happen too, is you have folks who are, and, and this is what this graph is showing, since it doesn't look like we're barreling towards any kind of a recession, this yield curve inversion, which is where the 10-year uh, yield is lower than the two-year yield on treasuries, it's saying that people think that interest rates are going to be cut uh, soon. And they're rushing out to buy 10-year notes because they can get what they perceive to be a very high yield on them. And they want to get it purchased before uh, the Federal Reserve cuts rates and they can no longer get 4.5% or whatever on their, on their treasury. And then they run away from the two-year, which if you want to peddle something that not very many people want at the time, you have to drop the price to get it sold, which increases the yield because we know that treasuries and bonds move inverse to the yields move inverse to price. OK. And so we look at this chart here from the uh, um, this comes from the, the CME site, and it's basically what market participants thinks is going to happen uh, in the, uh, as far as uh, the, the federal funds rate in the next over a period of time. Right now, 70 percent of the market thinks that there will be a rate cut uh, in March. And if you look at December, this is the target range for December of 24. OK. Most think that it's going to by far and away think that it's going to be one and a half percent or more less than it is right now. So the market thinks that rate cuts are coming. OK, but I go back to looking at unemployment and then look at. Oh, I didn't put it in there, but our GDP growth rates. Um, have actually been positive. The last one was higher than expected in the, in the uh, at four percent, and the projection for um, the most recent quarter four is two point two. So there really isn't a domestic uh, pending recession, you know, cloud looming that that we can see. So a lot of this is just based on folks thinking that eventually the you know here soon the Fed is going to cut rates. And, and I don't necessarily have the answer to the reason that, that the market thinks that because based on the fundamentals that I'm seeing right now and have seen over the past six months or a year, there just isn't anything uh, coming down the pipe 
or any trends right now that's that's showing oh man that, that things are going to change and uh change quickly and the fed's going to have to take aggressive action i i just simply don't see it at the moment and so my point is you go back to the board of governors comments and it, it doesn't sound like they're in too big of a hurry they of course they've left the option open to re cut rates but they've also said that it's going to be slow and methodical and it's going to be dependent upon inflation numbers continuing to come down or something else which they they've kind of been sticky the last three months or so. So I put this slide up here just to show these are the meetings that are scheduled by the Federal Reserve uh, this next year. Then the soonest one coming in January, uh, the rate cut expectation by a lot of the market is there in March. And then the ones with stars are kind of the big, bigger, important meetings. Uh, and, and this Fed has shown that if they are going to raise or in, uh, reduce or raise rates, they tend to do it at a meeting, though they don't have to. Uh, they could they could at any time. And so I guess I, I just want to leave that to say that right now it's going to be a data driven um, situation, that there isn't anything looming that I can see uh, in the tea leaves that, that makes you think that all of a sudden these rate cuts are coming, especially not in March. And I, I would be shocked if they actually do uh, cut rates by any amount in March at all. And and I used to uh, I used to. I used to be a little bit more um, cautious in my going against what those markets are saying, but uh, you know, as long as as long as these uh, these projections are based on the fundamentals, especially the ones that the Federal Reserve decision makers use, I think that in a lot of ways it's more market hope than it is actual expectation based on fundamentals that they're looking at. That's that's kind of kind of what I what I. Uh, uh, and picking up out of this. And so, you know, with that, I, I, I'm reluctant to say inflation is going to continue, uh, they're going to come down quickly enough that there would be a rate cut in the next three months, possibly not even in the next six months. If I had to kind of speculate on when I might see the first one, it would probably be toward the end of the year. And then finally, I guess I'd leave you with this and ask you a question is, as things sit right now in the U.S. economy with low unemployment, plenty of job openings, uh, GDP growth, pretty, pretty, pretty OK, not not tremendous, but not not certainly bad or anywhere leaning toward recession. What do you think would happen if the Federal Reserve suddenly slashed rates one or two percent in the next few months as far as inflation goes? What do you folks listening? What, what do you think would actually happen in, under those under those circumstances? as far as inflation do you think it would stay the same do you think it would go down or do you think it would spike back up really quickly because if you ask me i'm in the i'm in the last group that it would spike back up really quickly which actually already happened historically if you look back at the late 70s there was a uh, high inflation the federal Reserve funds rate was high to combat it uh, it it brought inflation down they aggressively cut rates and then it spiked right back up again. And I I'm I feel pretty confident, though they haven't said as much, that they certainly want to avoid a repeat of that. Okay. So that's kind of the outlook on there. I guess the, the, the take home one liner would be I expect rates to stay where they're at for quite some time. I, I don't know how long it's going to depend on what the data says, but that's that's where I sit right now. Uh, Frayne Olson is going to be speaking next. Uh, he's going to have to, he, his is pre-recorded actually um, due to him being on the road right now. So uh, take it away, Dave, get her, get her all set up. Thank you. I'm sorry. I won't be able to join you live today for, for today's session, uh, but I have recorded uh, my discussion here. And so we'll go through that. If you do have any questions, please feel free to, to contact me either email or call my cell phone and I'll try and answer those questions as soon as possible. So just very quickly, get my computer going here. A um, few key market movers. We're going to talk today about the USDA reports that came out last Friday and the implications for that. Um, USDA released four major reports. This is one of the biggest data dumps that USDA does all year long. So we had an update of the WASDE report, the World Agricultural Supply and Demand Estimates. That comes out every month and updates of production for both uh, updates for both forecasts of production as well as consumption, both domestically as well as internationally. We have the annual crop production report, which really covers the production acreage, planted acreage, harvested acreage, and total bushels for all of the major crops in the U.S. except for the small grains. 
uh, wheat, barley, oats, etc., which came out in September. We also got the quarterly grain stocks report, which is an inventory report of how many bushels of grain we have within the system as of a particular date. And then we have the winter wheat seedings report, which again will have a pretty good impact, impact on the wheat markets, in particular the acreages of winter wheat, which for both hard red winter and soft red winter is, is by far the largest acreage. Spring wheat obviously being planted later on in the season. So in general, at a very high level, I think most of you have figured out by now that these reports were negative for corn and neutral to slightly negative for soybeans and wheat. And we'll talk about those in a little bit, little, in a little bit of a moment. But this really uh, is, in my opinion, kind of the, these four reports set, reset the expectations or kind of the mental attitude of the marketplace coming out of the holiday season. So as I noted earlier in December, Coming into the holidays, we tend to have very low trading volumes, people taking vacations, uh, not only here in the US, but also globally because of the New Year's. And these US three reports are kind of that wake up call and we hit the reset button and saying, okay, where do we go from here? And unfortunately, the numbers came out a bit more negative than I had expected, and I think most of the traders had anticipated. So moving forward, the two other big things we're watching, of course, is Brazilian weather, the weather in Brazil and Argentina, and what kind of a crop they're going to have. And I'll talk about those in a moment. As well as some of the things that's starting to hit the market now is what we call the net short positions from the managed hedge funds. So we have the outside investment community that often uses commodities, which include crude oil and precious metals, but also the grains and the meat products as part of their managed portfolio, their investment portfolio. So right now, when you look at the net position of all the buyers and the sellers in this category of managed money, they're net short, which means we have more sellers than we have had buyers. And those positions right now at some point will need to be offset. So essentially what's happening is we have some negative fundamental news in the marketplace and that traders, these outside investment traders are, are trading off of that new news. And the pricing pendulum, in my opinion, has swung it a little bit too far to the negative. So when we get some, some new fundamental news, when, at, on, when we get this shift in attitude or shift in perspective again, a lot of these managed hedge funds will start to roll out of their positions. We'll start, instead of selling, they've been selling for a long time, they'll now come back into the market and try and buy off of those positions. So um, I, I'm, I'm not in panic mode yet, but I am getting a bit concerned, uh, in, in particular from a timeline standpoint. So let's go through the numbers very quickly to give you an update. Uh, first, let's talk about U.S. production. So this would be for corn and soybean production. Um, of all the numbers we got in, in those four big reports, the, probably the one that surprised the marketplace the most was the corn numbers. So the blue line on top is what the trade was expecting to see. So that's the average estimate from the traders. That's what they were expecting to see. And the red line on the very bottom is, of course, the numbers we got from USDA. So we were really expecting from a production standpoint, bushels produced to be relatively neutral. We had two kind of surprises in that. So when we looked at the harvested area, the acreage that was actually harvested, that went down a little bit. So we had a shrinkage in the harvested acreage, but as a result, we also had an increase in the average yield. So I think what happened is some of those acres that were under drought stress either got chopped for silage or abandoned for crop insurance, so our harvested acreage went down, the area that we harvested was smaller, and as a result, we only harvested those acres that were of the best, best quality or the highest yields, which then brought our average yield back up again. So when you do the math on total bushels produced, which is really the number we're after, we saw a slight increase. And now the reason that was so negative for the marketplace was because we were expecting a neutral to maybe slightly smaller number, and in reality, we got a bigger number. And of course, that was the shift or the tone in the marketplace that we got. On the soybean side, very similar story. We had harvested area. The acres we actually had harvested was down a little bit, but the yields jumped. The yields actually went up a little bit more than I, than I was expecting, but I think a lot of traders were expecting. So again, when you do the math of how many bushels did we actually produce, the number of bushels produced actually increased. So Few more acres harvested, but the yield per acre went up. We've got, in, as a result, more bushels. So when we translate that into what does that mean for bottom line carryover? What does that mean for the inventories of grain as we come into harvest of next year? So again, the blue line on top 
is the numbers that we were expecting to see. That's what the traders and analysts were thought their best estimates were gonna look like. And you drop down to the bottom in the red, those are the numbers we actually got. So small adjustments in wheat, most of it was from actually old crops, some numbers, some, some tweaking and adjustments from last year's numbers to make the change. So not a big shock value there, just some adjustments. On the corn side, we knew, we know that more bushels came in, there were some adjustments in consumption. Um, USDA did increase their forecast for both uh, livestock feed as well as ethanol consumption as prices come down now a little bit. We've got more bushels available. And so there was a partial offset, but our ending stocks, the amount of grain we expect to have in the bin, that buffer that we have is, is actually increased. And again, that's what put this negative tone, tone into the marketplace. The increase in production was greater than what we had an increase in the consumption side. Very similar story on soybeans. We had an increase in production, very uh, actually essentially no changes in the consumption side. So as a result, our bottom line, the amount of grain we're gonna have, our buffer stocks, if you wanna think about it that way, our Indian inventories um, went up a little bit. So again, the combination of expecting smaller numbers and getting larger numbers put this negative tone into the marketplace. Shifting to South American production, again, as we move forward, uh, Brazil now in the northern part of Brazil is starting their harvest, their soybean harvest. It's going to take a while to get through their entire acreage, but at least they're starting that process. So we are starting to get some reports. Um, this is going to be the kind of the news of the day for a while, both U.S. export sales, but more importantly, how big is that Brazilian and Argentinian crop? Once again, blue line on top is what the trade was expecting to see. Again, they were expecting to see minor adjustments, and essentially that's what we got from the Brazilian side, as well as the Argentine side. So small adjustments, we did take the size of the Brazilian crop down just a little bit, basically stabilized with a slight increase in the Argentinian crop. So if you compare the blue line on top with the red line on bottom, small minor adjustments, um, USDA, when, when, when there's a drought or weather problems, again, in particular in Brazil, which we'll talk about in a moment, they tend to take those numbers down relatively slowly. So a lot of the private forecasters are adjusting the forecast for Brazilian crop down much more rapidly than USDA will. I think USDA will get to some very similar numbers, but it's going to take them a little bit longer time to make those adjustments. They tend not to have big shock value or try not to have big shock value in their reporting. So the moral of the story is, yes, it looks like the soybean crop in Brazil is shrinking. It looks like the potential corn crop in Brazil is getting a little bit smaller. Um, now, based on expectations, the Brazilian, the Argentinian crop for both corn and beans were very, very similar. However, please look at the numbers that we had last year. So last year was the third year of consecutive drought in Argentina. They're now getting some rains. Their crop now this year is going to rebound significantly in total production actually coming back to more normal or typical levels. So it looks right now as though Argentina will have an average or a very typical sized crop. Shifting to the final big, uh, no, it's not the final big report, but one of the biggest reports would be this winter wheat seedings report. And again, the big winter wheat seedings numbers came in a bit smaller than expected. So for total winter wheat, as well as when you break it down by subclass, Hard red winter wheat, uh, for basically the Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas crop, there was there was about a 1.6 million, almost 1.7 million um, uh, acreage decrease. So we had a retracement or a cutback in hard red winter wheat seedings. We also saw a cutback in soft red winter wheat, which would be the Missouri, Illinois, Ohio winter wheats. Those were cut as well. Very stable numbers coming out of the, uh, the white wheat country, which is per primarily in the Pacific Northwest. So if you look at the total acreage cutback, you know, it's about 2.2, almost 2.3 million acres of winter wheat that wasn't seeded this year relative to last year. So that's a pretty substantial cutback in, in plantings for hardwood winter wheat. And, and we'll wait to see now as we move into the, the spring season, what the spring wheat acreage is going to do. But at least this sets the stage for a little bit tighter supplies for the winter wheat crop coming into this 2024 production season. Shifting to South American production, I just want to give a really quick recap and then I'll hand it off um, to our next speaker. This is a map of where Brazil produces soybeans. The darker the green, the more soybean bushels or tons are produced. 
Notice that in the northern part of the growing regions, northern and central part, we have a lot of soybeans produced. That northern region now is just beginning their harvest season. We're just starting to get a few harvest reports coming out of Mato Grosso. Um, really a mixed bag so far, but it's a little bit too early to try and give the yield reports and make any kind of consensus or judgments on what the crop is going to be. Now, I do want to talk a little bit about soil moisture and, and, and crop conditions. So if we look at the drought over the last, kind of the drought severity over the last 12, uh, last four weeks, last one month, earlier on in the season during planting and early crop development, that northern region, in particular in Mato Grosso and, and Goyos, into this area right here, were very dry. But over the last month or so, they've had some rain showers, uh, crop conditions have, been, have stabilized. There was some damage done earlier, but they've stabilized and soil moisture conditions have improved. However, when you look at the last month, again, this central region, which is still in the reproductive stages, is starting to see some damage now. We're going to start to see some stress. And that is a pretty large growing season, growing region, excuse me. And then you have the southern region, so we're really typically in pretty good shape. Well, if we look and zero in what's happened the last 10 days or so, now as, as that northern Mato Grosso region and into Goyo starts to be harvested, they're getting some higher rain showers. They're starting to recharge that soil moisture layer which is, is nice, it'll help improve um, some of the harvest conditions as long as the heavy rains don't continue. There has been some improvement into this central region uh, where both soybeans and corn are being grown, um, so, but there's still some stress. And so when we talk about weather conditions and crop stress, it's not really in the north for the soybeans in particular, but more now into the central region. And so when you take the damage that's already been done kind of in that northern region, you start a, a, a including some of the potential yield reductions now in the central regions. We have to be a little bit careful about, again, the, the total size and potential for the crop coming out of, Argen, uh, out of Brazil. Excuse me. Now, the other thing, just as a comment, we're starting to see the private forecasters as they update their yield and yield forecast start going down. So we will look at current crop condition. This is a vegetative health index. This has been updated for the first basically week of January. Notice in this area towards the north, it's turned white. Most of that is because the crop is now maturing. So we're looking at the greenness of the crop today relative to what we'd normally see that week of the year. And obviously because it, it's getting into harvest, there isn't much greenness left. We're starting to get into this neutral or, or basically no reporting. What we are now focusing on is this central area that I just showed where, where we're, we've had some drought stress. If it's in that browns or oranges, that shows that the, the crop health is below average. When you look at the greens, it's above average. So you can see that there are areas, especially now in some of the central growing regions, that are starting to show up with some stress. And that's also now starting to pull down some of the, the forecasts coming out of the private analysts. So again, USDA came in with about 157 million metric ton. The private analysts have starting to drop that. The lowest private number that I have seen is actually 135 million metric ton, which I think is a little bit on the low end, but it is showing that the attitude and the perspective of the soybean crop coming out of Brazil is, is decreasing. They're showing the problems are starting to show up. Shifting to Argentina very quickly, a much more smaller, more concentrated growing region. Um, it, it's not as large a growing region. It is obviously in Brazil. When we look at the one month drought severity and they over the last month or so during their planting and now crop development stages, they've been getting good rain showers. The soil moisture is starting to recharge based off of the drought that they had for the last several years. So crop conditions are starting to improve in Argentina. When you look at what's happened basically the last 10 days, there has been quite a bit of rainfall kind of on the edge, the western edge of the growing region, that core growing region in, in, um, in, in Argentina. When we look at the crop conditions, kind of what is the greenness of the crop, you do, do start to see some of these browns starting to show up, and that's not necessarily because of drought, it's that the crop is under stress because of too much moisture. Now, as everybody knows, soybeans as well as corn, when it starts to dry out, they can recover. There's, the yield potential is still there, and that's why we really haven't heard about or seen a lot of yield reduction coming out of, or yield forecast reduction coming out of Argentina. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing, and I wanna just say thank you for your time and attention, um, and I will now hand it over to the next speaker. Thank you very much.
Good afternoon, everybody. Actually, I'm coming to you from the Carrington Research Center. I just got through talking the last two hours uh, to our annual cattle feedlot school, so gave them a heavy dose of not only of outlook, but of uh, price risk management. And so today, there are a couple important USDA market reports coming up that I want to cover and then just uh, show you how we're doing starting 2024 with the cattle charts. So to begin with, the uh, USDA right now is doing a cattle inventory, the annual cattle inventory report. As you can see in the top right, they're going to release that just in about two weeks on January uh, 31st. And uh, so uh, uh, you're well aware, I think most of you from hearing me talk the last uh, months and so on, that we expect the cattle herd to be, be down, the beef cow herd to be down again. So uh, in the purple there on the right-hand side in the middle, uh, last year on January 1st, we had 28.92 million beef cows. That was actually below the number in 2014 when we had the previous record high prices. So no surprise that prices are record high again now. And, and so we're anticipating that report to show even lower numbers. And, and I just, just uh, you know, my guess right now is 28.3 million. And, and I think that's what maybe a lot of the trade is expecting. But when, when that report comes out, should that be down in the 27 million? That would really be a supportive to prices. On the other hand, if it would, you know, show not much reduction. And, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure there will be that. That would not be. But anyway, this would be the fifth straight year of liquidation, very supportive to prices and why we have record high prices. And the highest prices are going to occur when uh, herd rebuilding is, starts in earnest and it has not started yet. And it'll be interesting to see in that report on the bottom of how many repeat replacement efforts we have. Uh, you know, there's talk, and, and I was at another meeting yesterday about, you know, last time we rebuilt very fast. And so is that going to happen again when we rebuild and affect prices? But kind of interesting, if you put the bottom chart, go back to 2014, January 1st, we had 4.5 million uh, replacement heifers. And last January 1st, just barely over four, so a lot less on hand now. Now that Replacement heifer category is really two calf crops. On January 1st, when the report comes out, it'll be the heifers that were bred last summer, and there weren't many of them because, uh, and we'll look at the cattle and feed report in a minute, that they went into feedlots because it was so dry, but it's the, it's the heifers that were bred. And then it's also this, this year's calf crop, these uh, little 500, 600 pound uh, heifers and, and so on, that they say they're going to be replacement heifers. And, and uh, so, so that could show some more, more replacement heifers because there is interest, but, but those heifers do not have to win with the bull this summer, and it all depends on rain. rain. So uh, look forward to that report. Uh, my, my next webinar, webinar, I will cover the report in earnest. Let's, let's quickly go through the different market classes of cattle, starting off with the fed steers. They, the fed steer price, in particular, those distant futures when the feeder cattle uh, now will be sold as, as market steers. And, and so, so the, the green, green is uh, 2021, and then the uh, the um, purple kind of is, is uh, 2022. The blue towards the top is last year, and then the red line just starting on the left-hand side is where we are now. So you see a continuous cyclical increase. Actually, our last cyclical low uh, was, is, is taken off this chart now. I was showing last year was 2020. So we've been up nicely every year. And then uh, this year, we really rebounded with the fewer numbers we have. Beef production was record high in 2022 because of all the cows that we killed. And we backed off cow slaughter uh, some now last year. And so uh, beef production was down about 5%. And so that really caused fed cattle prices to go up to uh, record high prices up there most of the year after April being up there over 180 we have did see prices fall off a little bit at the end of the year, and uh, a couple of reasons for that. One is that uh, the, the feedlots kept the cattle longer, and they got heavier, so we got uh, carcass weights quite a bit above, and then uh, and so that kind of affected the market. And then the competing meat prices are all down. Pork prices are low with chicken prices, and so uh, that has somewhat affected the fed cattle prices too. And then the futures are in the red squares up there. 
And uh, they're actually showing by mid-year lower prices than this year. And uh, you, if you've been following the futures market, it was off sharply since September 15th. I talked to you in the last webinar about all those reasons why, so I'm not going to get into that this time. Actually, we were up near 200 on uh, on uh, April futures, and now they're down there at 178. The futures market has been strong in the last several weeks. Uh, Fed cattle are up another dollar or two today in the futures, and feeder cattle are up between two and three dollars. So the the uh, the squares you see here, you have to bump them up a dollar so. And but I think. Uh, Fed, Fed cattle, cattle can do better than the futures are indicating. Again, Again they, they were higher just a few months ago. USD is uh, projecting 178.25, and they came down. And last year's average was 175.54, and that's the annual average. So USD is still saying we're going to be up a little bit. And I think we will be can be up above the blue line, and it really really depends on consumer demand is the the thing to watch there. But anyway. We're still at record high levels, and that's been supportive to feeder cattle. The other thing that affects feeder cattle prices, calf and feeder cattle prices, are corn prices. Again, you change corn, 10 cents, change calf prices, but in the opposite direction. So you see there that uh, blue line on the uh, top was last year. I like to use Omaha prices because that's where the feedlots are, the buyer feeder cattle. And, and last year we had seven dollar corn in Omaha, and, and last week the red line shows it was four sixty five. So that, that continually flying throughout the year was very very supportive to uh, to uh, cattle prices. And you know, Frain talked about corn and so on a record uh, corn crop, and that's all weighing in. So the lower corn prices are supporting calf prices, as you see here again. Cyclically, they've been up. Or they were up in twenty twenty one. They're green and up again. And, 2022, 2022 last, last year they just stored because the, the two biggest factors, factors that affect them are fed cattle the you know and they were record high and corn and corn fell and so uh, we did 80 dollar better uh, calves there throughout the mid-summer and uh we're starting out the red line on the upper left hand corner just under 300 uh dollars again 80 dollars higher than they were here at this last time again we're going to have fewer calves to sell these year and, and so that's supported we don't know what corn prices are going to do or, you know with, with the record crop and lower corn prices are farmers going to cut back the corn so will that mean higher corn is all yet to be determined and would affect uh, calf, calf prices and also, also what you know can feed fed cattle rebound a little bit more than what the future say now uh you know that would be supportive so we have some factors there to watch but still starting off at a much higher level and i think there will be support throughout the year if nothing else, based on the lower supply. The heavyweight background of cattle, the very same story there, cyclically higher every year, soaring this year with the lower corn and the higher uh, fed cattle. They usually do back off seasonally, as you see there, since September 15th. I talked about that last time. So that's more of a seasonal uh, thing that isn't uh, unusual. But then fed cattle did go down some, and that affected us a little bit. The red uh, squares there are the feeder cattle futures market, which are kind of above for the most of the year to a little bit uh, just uh, below there in August. But anyway, they were a lot higher too up there in the 280s just back in September 15th and has backed off for a variety of reasons. But we could even do uh, better than this and we're already showing better prices than last year. We're starting out there in the upper uh, uh, on the left-hand side, side there, the red line, uh, uh, you know, it's spent, you, you know, know, significantly above the last year, year and, and and there's certainly potential to stay at, you know, above last year, at least the later on in the year, year and, and, uh, and depending on what corn and so on does. So, you know, know uh, price, cattle being sold now are bringing very, very good prices from, uh, you know, compared to the previous year. And, and then, of course, cows, if you're a cow calf producer, and 2018 to 20% of your income comes from cows, the same story there, cyclically higher and higher, but a very definite seasonal pattern when they go up into the mid-year and back off quite substantially when uh, the PG checking starts and the cows come to market. But again, there we're starting $20 uh, higher than we were last year. And, you know, if it rains and, and herd rebuilding starts and we slaughter a lot less cows, and that's yet to be determined, would be very supportive to cow prices as well. Oh, you know, they had, on an annual basis, we expect cattle prices to be higher, but, but 
you know, from a price risk management standpoint, uh, you know, on a seasonal basis, if we're backgrounding or summer grazing or feeding cattle to slaughter wheat or whatever when they're coming out, I still think some kind of price risk management is warranted. If nothing else, looking at what happened to the futures market the last uh, several months should be, uh, you know, a guide for us to use there. And so in the middle there, you know, volatility is high. We've leveled off a little bit here, but, you know, the futures are up 2 or $3 a day. And just a couple of weeks ago, they were up 5 and down 5 so a lot of volatility. So when we're on the upward part of the price cycle, like we are here, uh, the best marketing strategy is to lock in some kind of a floor price, but leave the top side open. So, you know, if we do get higher prices and everything comes together, go up a record high again, uh, that we can take advantage of that. But in case of some catastrophic events or, or something happens, maybe uh, let's Look, look at a floor, floor price. So two, two ways to do that. that. That's LRP insurance, insurance and futures market options. options. That's, That's what I just spent an hour talking about at our feedlot feed school. Oh, uh, tomorrow, tomorrow there's a cattle, cattle on feed report, report which may or may not be eventful. On the upper right hand you see the side, you see the last cattle on feed reports. They come out monthly. And as expected, that red line there was this year and the blue line was last year in the purple line average and we were more on average we were below last year because we have fewer cattle and that was the expectation and lo and behold when the october report came out we went above the average and above last year the same thing in november and the same thing in december and so the market kind of really reacted the futures market the cash market not as much really reacted negatively to those numbers saying oh usd is wrong we got a lot more cattle than we thought we had and you know, you know, there's no tomorrow and all that. And that wasn't the case at all. What that was is showing up. And, and we don't record heifers on feed every month. That's a quarterly thing. And I think this one uh, tomorrow maybe is, is the quarter. So we'll see that. But we had re record heifers uh, uh, on feed here in the last few months simply because it was dry. And the, some of those heifers that were called replacement heifers did not go in with the bull this summer and ended up in the feedlot. And, and so because, because of that, that that's what sparked our higher numbers, numbers on feed. Not, not that we have more total cattle. We have fewer steers on feed, but, but it's just that heifer category, category is huge because of so dry at, at the end of last year, again, 76% of our cow herd was in drought. And we've, we've been, been like liquidating heifers in dry. There's a lot of improvement in moisture here in the last uh, few couple of months and weeks and so on. So the cattle on feed report on the left for... Uh, for the average, we're still expecting, you know, the cattle on feed to be higher by about 2.2%. But with, I think placements, we did place a lot of cattle early, too, because of uh, lack of winter wheat that now is sparked and, and, and uh, some, some earlier marketing and so on. And so, uh, you know, the, the estimates down on the bottom shows you the, the people that make the estimates, and we're, we're one of them at North Dakota, Dakota State, but uh, anyway, the cattle on feed uh, estimates are a lot closer, but you see the next category on placements, quite a wide range in what how much placements may have been down, but again, it's the cattle on feed number that's important, but what the watch is, uh, the trade is expecting 2.2% more, and so if we would be even higher than that, would not be good for the market, but maybe come in lower than that would be supported. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over to Dave. So I just have a few brief comments. Uh, actually, revisiting a few things that I've talked about in the last couple of months, but it's really kind of hitting ahead. Um, and its implications for for agriculture, for North Dakota agriculture, can't be underemphasized. Uh, speaking about climate disclosure laws uh, that are coming uh, from a variety of different places, uh, so the, these laws are being placed again a law, so it's it's regu regulation. It's going to require businesses to report greenhouse gas emissions and the related risks either they introduce or that they might be subject to. Um, the why is obviously there's concerns about uh, greenhouse gases and climate, um, and across these different platforms, there's a there's a lot of variation in terms of who has to report, what do they have to report, when do they report, what are the standards, 
how disaggregate does the 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 information have to be? Um, what are the the standards in terms of how things are framed uh, and, and so forth? I've, I've talked a little bit in the past too about this greenhouse gas accounting. So we we do have in place global standards uh, for calculating emissions. And one of the big things in that is how we look at emissions for a corporation, which we call scopes, uh, essentially three different buckets, scope one, two, and three. Uh, scope one are direct emissions. So if I, uh, for example, if I'm a farmer and I have diesel fuel and I, I use it in my field, I'm gonna have tailpipe emissions uh, among many different types. Uh, going along the same uh, line of thinking, if, if I'm thinking about scope two, as a farmer, let's say that I'm using nitrogen fertilizer, some, some anhydrous. Well, there were emissions associated when, when that was manufactured. And so that would be a scope two. And then finally, there's scope three, uh, which are up and down the supply chain. And this hits a lot of things. I, and really where this gets interesting is because of the nature of agricultural and food supply chains, uh, North Dakota farmers, uh, both uh uh, farmers and 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 livestock producers are are almost certainly in another company's scope three. You you, you basically have to be because it's going somewhere. And then in most cases, uh, at some point, that does touch a very large corporation who may be subject to these climate disclosure laws. Um, I talked a little bit about the SEC. Uh, so Securities Exchange Commission oversees uh, some markets, in the United States. Uh, the 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 in, in terms of the New York Stock Exchange, other things like that, overlooking uh, the behavior of publicly traded companies. And so that's where they focused. They had a proposed rule a year and a half ago. Uh, and so that would be basically a description of what the policy would look like. They opened it up for comments. They got a ton of comments back uh, and a lot of pushback saying, you know, in, in a variety of ways that this was not uh what was wanted or what could be achieved uh, in short order. And the SEC actually did in, in October kind of say, you know what, you know, we're going to, we're not going to move as fast or in the same ways that we said we were going to. And that was a bit of a sigh of relief to, uh, to industry, to these companies and others, because it, it, it simply is a very big lift. At the same time, I've talked about uh, the climate disclosure laws in California um, those are law now, uh, so they have that that full weight and effect of, of the state of California. And again, they can only really regulate what happens in their state. And so if there's transactions, people doing business in their state, they can regulate that. And they've essentially decided for now that any business that has more than a million dollars in sales that does business, any business in California has to report their, their greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and so this is about 700 companies. But again, as I've, I've mentioned before, you know, even though a North Dakota farmer may have no business uh, directly in the state of California, if they're producing Durham that turns into pasta, and then maybe you could say it's Cremet or Barilla or whomever it is, suddenly you're in their scope three and you're subject to these climate, uh, these climate disclosure laws. And that doesn't mean that they're, they're going to come to your farm and look specifically at what you're doing. Uh, but they are going to consider what the emissions are for the production of that product. And so that could be a okay thing, um, may not impact you directly, or it might be a very big thing if those numbers are wrong. Or as the case really is, if those numbers don't exist, you may have a lot of difficulty marketing your crops. Um, other reason I bring this up, and, and it, it's news to some extent, um, I've, I've long kind of given the comment when thinking about biofuel policy or uh, sustainability policy generally, uh, you know, Europe was about 10 to 15 years ahead of, of the U.S. California was five to 10 years ahead. And then the U.S. as a whole would come along. That's really kind of close to where we're at because the European Commission has been working on this for more than a decade and they're they're sustainability reporting in general came into effect last January, so a year ago, but their reporting standards uh, are actually in force as of January 1st. And so these are very, very uh, uh, robust standards, demanding standards. It's, you know, it's a quick 1200 page read of the standards uh, and then actually going through with it. But right now, 
uh, as of July 1, we know that any U.S. company that's also listed on a European stock exchange within a, an EU country uh, is going to have to start reporting. Um, and then we know that next year already, so again, less than 12 months, it's going to be expanded greatly um, to, if, to, to U.S. companies or, or companies from outside the EU that have more than 250 employees, more than $42 million in, in EU revenue in dollars, or assets greater than $21 million, which is a very, very low number. And the expectation is this is about 3,000 U.S. companies. And so we know that in short order, uh, a lot of uh, food and egg companies are subject to this. Many of them are subject to it now. Uh, and that's going to expand next year. Uh, we don't export everything to Europe. There's a lot of, lot of our products, you know, that are consumed in the United States or elsewhere outside of outside of the EU. Um, but we can look forward to California, which is going to have similar laws, you know, shortly after 2025. And then ultimately what we, we can, I think what we can reasonably expect is that as this, as these laws come into place, as corporations and the firms that work with them, accounting firms and others, you know, help build up the, these reporting systems, that it's really only a matter of time before the SEC says, well, of course we can do this. It's, it's somewhat of an easy lift, uh, less demanding on corporations because many of them will already be regulated because they do business in the EU or California. And I really want to just kind of put this on everybody's uh, radar because it affects producers and all of us that are involved in agriculture. Uh, a wrong number would be a problem. The absence of a number may mean that you don't have market access. That might be a, a very big concern for Europe. You know, you may lose your, you may lose customers and, you know, might not be a farmer directly, but maybe someone that they sell their crop to may no longer be able to meet that requirement because they don't have a good carbon footprint number for that product. And, you know, going from there, there's, missing pieces, and then also a whole lot of work that has to be done to build up a robust system. The only shred of kind of hope that this will take a little bit of time is some folks do recognize how difficult this is to do for certain industries, including agriculture. So there might be a bit of a delay, primarily, you know, not, not with the EU, but maybe with California. But I think we can really start seeing the future now of what's going to be required of large businesses and then continuing to push down to field level operations for most U.S. producers, including those in North Dakota. Um, those were my comments. Uh, we knew, do have time now for Q&A. I know that, that Brian had some provoking questions uh, to in, engage with participants. Definitely uh, worthwhile to kind of continue that conversation about the relationship between the Fed rate and inflation and, and how that might actually turn out. I, I'd also mention too, going back to Frayne's comments, we actually do have higher expected use for ethanol in the next, or excuse me, in this in this crop year for corn, which is you know nice, but it's it's because we have a lot prices are somewhat low, but we 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 do see that use kind of coming on board. So with that, we'll just take a couple of minutes. Uh, the floor is yours. Feel free to use the chat or the Q&A tool, and we'd be happy to answer any questions you have. And I don't know if any of the other panelists have any comments yeah. that they want to make. We'll be back next month. A note that it will be a bit early on the calendar. Uh, the WASD comes out on February 8th and, you know, come out at 11 o'clock, and we'll be uh, talking about that and other things uh, by 1 p.m. Central Time. So thanks, everybody, for coming. I hope that we have good weather between now and then. A question might have just sprung up. Oh, so a question. Are there any other states interested in new emission rules like California? So I would say the answer to that is yes. What is going on generally, what we've seen, California built and maintains a huge apparatus for its low-carbon fuel standard, so transportation fuels. And in California, they're leveraging that for a lot of these climate disclosure rules. We also have low carbon fuel standards in Oregon and Washington, and they kind of piggyback or have similar programs to what California has. So what I would fully expect or be ready for is that 
states with s- similar political interests or or ideological leanings as California does are probably going to be very interested in adopting climate disclosure laws similar to what California has. They'll follow their lead. You know, again, it's Europe followed by California, followed by the United States, but there might be other states there. And again, I could see, for example, we see this on the LCFS side, Oregon and Washington State, you know, maybe a few years afterwards. Again, it it, it does and doesn't matter. California is such a large market that it's big enough that it can make folks do things. Uh, the, the analogy I give is, you know, a few years ago, Vermont had a mandatory labeling law and there was, you know, very little response to that. It's like Vermont's a small state. They, they really can't push things. They can create these rules, uh, but they can't necessarily have enough, you know, market power to make companies really want to react. California on its own can do that. California already has a huge bureaucratic system with the California Air Resources Board to manage the low carbon fuel standard. Uh, so I, I would expect them to continue to lead and certainly see that expansion. My thought, my expectation would actually be the SEC will probably will take this on a lot more quickly um, than folks might have wanted if it was just the SEC working alone, because you're going to have all of these U.S. companies that have to meet the EU standards. And this is huge talk within agriculture. And there's a bunch of companies that have to uh, meet those standards in California. Why not just make it everybody? I mean, once you're talking, you know, thousands, maybe 10,000 companies, larger companies, uh, having a national requirement, again, for the SEC publicly traded companies, to me, isn't that big of a leap. And with my long answer and no other questions, I think that we'll we'll end the webinar. Again, I'd like to thank the panelists for presenting today and everybody for attending. We'll see you uh, on February 8th. Thanks. Thank you.